good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the day, conserving and enhancing the most intact and readily recoverable peatlands, examples of peatland habitats from across Scotland. I'm Andrew McBride from Land and Habitats, and welcome, welcome to welcome you to Sunny Perthshire. I did, I did write Sunny Perthshire at first, but uh, the sun's actually gone in since I wrote that. Looking after good habitats is actually one of the hardest things. We would think restoring is actually a very difficult thing to actually do, but very often it's a lot harder to actually get money and people's attention to actually maintain existing good habitats. And it's all well and good as restoring lots of peatland habitat, but if we're not looking after that in the longer term, then the gains that we're potentially going to make off some of the restored areas are going to be lost as other habitats degrade. And so that's what this session is hopefully going to be covering in the next hour and a bit um, with various sort of uh, ideas coming from different parts of the using um, different types of wetlands across, across the EU. I'll uh, introduce you to Dan is works for Natural England. He's their uh, habitats advisor for lowland habitats. And uh, he deals with England's lower altitude bogs and wetlands. Like many of the agency staff, he basically has to um, give advice on all the different aspects that tend to manage to actually uh, have a, some effect on wetlands. And so that's, that takes up a lot of his time. I'm, I'm reliably informed on a good day, he does actually get to go out to some sites which are in good condition and advise on the management of those. Um, he also reminds me that he was co-author and editor of the Fen Management Handbook, which he advises is a very good read and available on various, uh, free on various websites, but also available from a um, soft copy as well. So if you're interested in that, um, I don't think anybody gets any royalties from it. So it's just a, a goodwill gesture and it's out there. So I'll hand over to Ian now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Dyack from Natural England. Uh, Andrew, I hope, has told you what I do and uh, all that stuff. So I'll get straight into this talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about conserving, restoring and enhancing remnant peatland, giving an overview of the situation in England at the moment. Um, I mean, this, this direct response to the first objective in the UK peatland strategy, which is to conserve and enhance through restoration management, the best and most readily recoverable peatlands. Um, I've, I've shortened this a bit, but um, which says bring about the long term preservation, enhancement and sustainable management of peatlands in areas that support semi natural mire vegetation and other semi natural vegetation on peat soils through maintaining and enhancing uh, a suite of protected sites at various levels to ensure the favourable status of habitats and species. Do that through conserving functional ecosystem units. Uh, and then preventing damage to those from external activities and ensuring the full long term costs of any potential damaging activity is properly taken into account. So I did uh, ponder how, how I was going to do this and then um, I thought, well, we, we did review the Triple SI series for bogs and fens uh, in 2015. So I think it'd be very useful to just go through some of the findings of that work, which haven't been widely shared, I think it's fair to say. So th this was part of a review of all of the uh, habitats that we notify SSSIs for and all the um, species groups that we notify sites for. Um, the purpose of the exercise was to evaluate habitat resource and features for which SSSI notification is appropriate, review the existing coverage and representativeness of the current series, provide recommendations to guide future notification, provide guidance on setting boundaries to, re to reflect those features and to identify any other issues that are pertinent to future triple SI notifications. And this, this was, I suppose, was the culmination of work on triple SIs that came out of a public accounts committee review in 2010. And yeah, most of these were, were done by 2015. So I carried out the reviews for the Fen series and the Raised Bog series in England. 
Uh, the key messages of this, I think I've uh, summarised over the next two slides. Um, well, you sort of gratifying that we found that most peatlands supporting natural and high value semi natural vegetation are in triple SIs. However, there are notable gaps and omissions. Looking at bogs first, most active bog is in triple SIs, very small amount that isn't. But um, there's a lot of primary bog sites with degraded surface. So in some cases, semi-natural vegetation is not protected. And when uh, looking at the number of sites, over half of those sites are not protected by triple SI status. Something that's become apparent since the review, which I thought was worth mentioning, is that many raised bogs kind of in what's considered the uplands are not in triple SI. And I think you know, in work in Northumberland and Cumbria recently has, has highlighted there are quite a lot of these sites, some of them very, very rich and quite intact are not um, notified, but we, we haven't sort of fully quantified that yet. In terms of fens, found that uh, nearly one fifth of the extent of transition mire and quaking bog is not protected by triple SI status. So there's no statutory protection uh, and over 25% of stands of alkaline fen are not protected by triple SI status. Many of those in the uplands on enclosed land, but there are a few of this you know, exceptionally uncommon habitat in the lowlands that still aren't uh, protected by triple SI status and therefore at you know, significant risk of loss or damage. Looking at um, boundary issues, we found that most peatland sites, particularly lower altitude sites, don't have adequately protected boundaries, um, as is described in the SSSI notification guidance, which requires all potentially uh, land that might affect the feature to be included. And there are two kind of main issues here. The first of those is that many notifications do not include the whole peat body. Um, I'll show some examples of that later, obviously making it very difficult to achieve hydrological uh, restoration or integrity across the site. Even fewer include sufficient land around the peatland to protect it from damaging operations on, on land that clearly um, influences the condition of the site, um, particularly issues from nutrient enrichment and drainage here. And again, I'll give an example of that. We also found that there are many peatlands, well, many, quite a few peatland sites that have been notified for habitats that are derived from degradation of the original peatland. And the, probably the main example of that is um, wet grassland triple SIs, some very large ones, some set levels, which were you know, we know from stratigraphy and old records were raised bog, tall calcareous fens, swamp woodlands. Um, very little of that habitat is there now. And particularly where we're looking to restore the range of those habitats, there's none of that habitat in those areas. So we really need to be thinking about uh, what we should be doing with those sites. The other obvious one is Amberley Wild Brooks in Sussex, again, not an area with any raised bogs. Um, we can also considered kind of likely climate impacts and how, how that might affect the triple SI series as it was. And I think my you know, conclusion was that the, the failings of the series are, are the main issues that they, these are all likely to be worsened by the climate impacts, particularly thinking of things like extreme rainfall events on land around a basin mire, for instance, that's in arable cropping, huge soil losses, nutrient runoff into sites, um, clearly going to cause damage. And also, if we haven't got uh, hydrological integrity and we're not able to restore, the effects of summer drought are going to be much worse than they would be if the site was in good nick. Uh, just a reminder of um, work that was done in across Europe in 2016, the Red List of European Habitats, which identified Myers as the most threatened group of habitats overall and highlighted that 
so, you know, some of our British or English uh, peatlands are particularly threatened. In the endangered category, we had raised bog, alkaline fen, and tall calcareous fen. And uh, in the vulnerable category, so still threatened, but not having had quite such severe losses, things like valley mire systems, which they've shown it, valley bog, acidic fen, which often people kind of, I don't know, gloss over, uh, all sorts of quaking mires and um, high altitude rich fens. So just worth thinking about those in the context of um, triple SI series and where our priorities perhaps should be. So going back to triple SI and the protected sites and how they're working for peatlands. I think, you know, it, it, I suppose it's, it's fairly obvious that the ones that work best are generally the ones that are part of much bigger landscape scale notifications where they're surrounded by natural and semi-natural habitats. There is no intensive land use within them. Uh, New Forest is a good example. Most of them are upland, I should say. The lowlands have probably got very few uh, of that sort of notification. But the New Forest is one that does. 29,000 hectares of triple SI, heathland, woodland, streams, yeah, extremely rich habitats. Um, and as a result of that, the Myers are in um, generally, well, I'd say very, most of them are in sort of very good condition comparatively to uh, the rest of the Valley Mire resource in the south. This is Fort Bog, which is a, a lovely Mire. You can see it's got a very, it's a valley head system. Uh, lovely transition from dry heath through humid heat, wet, wet heath, seepages with um, marsh, club moss, rare species, and into the mire, which is uh, largely sort of quaking sphagnum, narthesium mire with very nice soakways. And you know, because these sites are relatively undamaged. They still support a lot of rare species. So this Fort Bog has um, slender cotton grass. You know, it's one of possibly five sites in the whole of the UK. Um, marsh fern, royal fern, it's, it's, it's a great site. It's not undamaged. There are a couple of drains in it from the 19th century and there's probably peat cutting. But overall, it's the, the, the lack of nutrient enrichment and severe damage and pressures from outside have meant it's in very good state. To sites that are not so well notified, um, we go to the border myers um, between uh, this is sort of borders of Cumberland, Cumbria and Northumberland, going up to the Scottish border and kind of north from around Hadrian's Wall North. Um, this is a truly exceptional peatland landscape. It's in, in many ways analogous to the flows of Caithness and Sutherland, uh, not least because it's got lots of Sitka spruce planted in it. But as you can see from the map here, which um, we've got the peat layer on the map. So the shallow peat is the kind of pale browny color, deep peat is the purpley brown color, and the triple SI units are marked in uh, orange, triple SI, sorry marked in orange. So you can see there's a, there's a great area of deep peat that's not uh, within the triple SI. If you look at a smaller scale, you can see that many of those triple SIs, the individual triple SIs, cover only a tiny amount of the peat around them. Um, many of those only cover a small area in the center of a mire. Lots of the outside of the mire where we've got the mineratrophic fens and the lags and the flows, and again, kind of unparalleled elsewhere in England, those are not often in the triple SI. And we have very high quality raised bogs with sphagnum fuscum in the top left there. You know, very rare species now in England, still present, a sign of a you know, high quality mire. And also the base rich flushes around the umbrogenous domes, such as the um, Sphagnum worn storfii in the bottom right hand corner. Again, not a common species. These are all in bits of the site that are not protected by triple SI. A boundary issue that has led to loss and damage to the site in kind of living memories, Winbury Moss, which is a basin mire. 
uh, I think some of you may have gone to this on um, another IUCN conference a few years ago. This is in South Cheshire. It's a, it's a fantastic site, the quaking umbrotrophic middle and a base rich lag all around the uh, north side with source edge and all sorts of nice stuff in it. The boundary on the south side takes in the slope. The boundary on the north side doesn't take in the catchment slope, which is marked by the pale blue line. The triple SI boundary is the darker blue line. Um, as, as you might be able to see in the photograph, there's arable cropping to the north of the site on highly transmissive soils. So there's been maize on there for many years with slurry applications, inorganic nitrogen applications, and consequently very high nitrogen concentrations in the aquifer, which feeds the base rich part of the site. And we've, we've lost nearly all of the characteristic brown mosses of oligotrophic fens over the last 40 years. Um, so yeah, yeah, these things matter. There are big impacts of not getting the boundary right. Um, to just to give an example of where we are working with the best sites to um, enhance them and restore uh, hydrological integrity, particularly to kind of give them resilience, but also to restore uh, the extent and range of some of those really uncommon habitats, really threatened habitats. Uh, we could talk about Hors the Horsewater Complex, which is part of Gate Barrows National Nature Reserve in North Lancashire. You can just see on the um, little map in the corner, it's there, it's on the kind of northeast side of Morecambe Bay in the Arnside and Silverdale AONB. It's a gorgeous site, we've got a, one of the finest mile lakes in uh, Britain here, it's Horsewater, a little Horsewater here, which has been drained, there was a hole blasted in a limestone ridge to drain it, so that was probably the previous extent of the site, and then Horsewater Moss at the bottom, which is a, a drained and cut over moss. It's still quite a rich fen at the moment. Um, we're restoring hydrological kind of integrity to this site, we're reversing the effects of the drainage. It's, this is a long process, but we're, we're underway now. We've, we've got all the research to back it up. Not straightforward. Uh, there are rare species in the damaged, degraded peatlands. Local people like it the way it is and various bits of infrastructure and houses have been built while it's been in a drained state. So yeah, this is not straightforward, but um, I think we're making very good progress here as we are on several national nature reserves to uh, restore natural hydrological function across the peatland and associated land, uh, which is uh, you know, some, which we need to be doing across all these peatland size. Um, other action to improve protection and enhance sites include ongoing survey programs, eco-hydrological reviews of sites, consideration of natural systems, investigations through drivers to address nutrient and water quantity issues. We are doing some new notifications, admittedly not many, and you know, obviously you know about all the major restoration programs. Uh, life funded ones, most of the future, etc. Many of which are working on triple SIs. In the future, obviously, government's got big ambitions for extending protected areas, the 30 by 30 target, which will include some new designation. As yet unknown how much though. 75% of triple SIs to be in favourable condition by 2042. Uh, that's quite ambitious, um, but it's a strong driver for more peatland work and um, developing restoration plans for all peatland SSIs, which may be part of the peat implementation program, which Naomi talked about. And obviously need to ensure the prominence of peatlands in nature recovery areas and the new approach to nature conservation um, coming soon. Right, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I can't be here with you to answer any questions because I'm going up to the border Myers, uh, of which uh, obviously this is the finest Butterburn flow. But um, if you have any questions, please email me and I'll see if I can, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, so otherwise, thank you and I'll hand you back to Andrew.
Thank you very much for that, Ian. You're really highlighting the effect that lines have on maps and how boundaries can affect people. Management. I think really how it's about hydrological integrity. I hope you can actually hear me. We're having problems with bandwidth, but uh, hopefully it'll catch up. Um, Latin America in the border miles of the Pope country, which obviously takes us to our next speaker, uh, Stephen Andrews, who works for the Highland Council in Scotland. And he works specifically as the flow heritage coordinator. Stephen, from the stepping stone of geological research and teaching, has, sp has spent extensive periods investigating past environments in Greenland and northern Scotland. He grew up on the edge of the flow country, and his, the role which he has taken up seems a very natural step for him to actually take. In his spare time, he is outdoors like climbing and walking and biking. So I'd like to hand you over to people, please. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak to you. Uh, my name is Stephen Andrews. I'm the project coordinator for the Flow Country World Heritage Bid, and I'm based at the Highland Council. And it's this bid that I want to talk to you about today and just look at how we're moving the Flow Country towards UNESCO World Heritage status. So just to provide an outline of what I'm going to speak to you about, um, first of all, cover well, where is the flow country? Um, how do we define the area that we want to nominate? Um, I'll talk then about the, the kind of background. How have we got to this point? Then, well, who's who initiated this this latest incarnation of the bid, and how's how's that organised? And then I want to move on to some more of the technicalities around uh, world heritage, and this all really boils down to the OUV or the Outstanding Universal Value. So what is it and how is that supported? The key pillars of that, um, that Outstanding Universal Value are the criteria, um, the integrity, and then the protection management. And then I'll just briefly touch on a few of the challenges that, that we're going to be encountering and have been encountering um, in this bid. So where is it? Well, we're stuck up here on the, on the very far north, um, northern portion of, of Scotland. Um, and actually just a bit further north than where I'm speaking from uh, today. Um, so if we get a little bit closer and we look at this actually rather confusing map, um, this is the this is basically defining the boundary of the of the site or certainly a draft boundary where we're still currently um, finalizing this. And that's identified in, in the green lines. But the key thing here to note is that it, it basically surrounds all of these uh, triple SIs. And those triple SIs are also uh, Ramsar designated uh, and also um, have the Natura uh, designations also. So they're actually, in terms of the protection that's afforded these areas, they're already um, as highly protected as, as they could be within the, the UK um, system. So how did this whole kind of idea for world heritage status come about well i suppose the, the first stage in that was in the in the mid 1980s when the flow countries were being um well ripped apart to put it uh, politely um for the for the planting of, of woodland and we can see i mean this image i think really illustrates that um nicely or horrifically as we might consider it and this is from lindsay and anderson's recent publication and it, it it shows that not only were the areas which were relatively dry um, in inverse commas and um, being ploughed but they were trying to plough right out into into pool systems um, and we're really onto onto a losing kind of thread um, right from the beginning in fact when you go and look at the satellite images now you can still see these plough marks around the the the, the left side of that streamline um, and they were trees were never even put in there and um, they just damaged the bog and, and kind of went away as it were so in this led to the, the kind of the realization of what we needed to start um, well describing and protecting and in 1988 there was the publication of the, the kind of flow country bible so the peatlands of Caithness and Sutherland um, and within that tucked away at the back there's an interesting little line where they, they recognize that in fact that the flow country appears especially well qualified for world heritage listing and in fact when you read this this publication it reads very much like a, a nomination document but 1988 was a long time ago, um, and it wasn't, in fact, until 2020 that we managed to get the the flow country to the top of the the, um, the tentative list in the UK. And this was work led by uh, Joe Perry, um, him and the collaborators around the project, 
um, got this got this to over the line as it were or the first the first line the first hurdle um, and we were allowed to proceed to nomination uh, without returning to the technical evaluation panel so that's where we're at now and we're, we're proceeding towards that that uh, producing that nomination document so the group that kind of brought this forward were uh, the Peatland Partnership, which I think are soon to be renamed the, the Flow Country Partnership. And we can see the lead um, kind of organisations within that are the Highland Council, RSPB, Nature Scott, with a whole lot of other uh, contributors, which are, provide a really nice kind of um, rounded uh, set of viewpoints from the, the north of Scotland. This has been expanded to provide us the, the Flow Country World Heritage Steering Group. So these are effectively now the, the those that are involved and particularly Wildland has come on and, and provided a bit more uh, backing as well from a financial perspective. But we can see that we've got all sorts of um, organisations within that that provide the different perspectives which are important to kind of juggle when we're thinking about how we're going to um, bring this project to, to fruition. So on to the kind of slightly more technical aspects of, of World Heritage. So the key element of World Heritage uh, designations are revolve around the outstanding universal value. And that's supported by three main pillars, the criteria. So what is it that is special? Um, the integrity, i.e. how um, intact is that, is that region? And then the protection and the management. So I just want to talk about each of those, focusing more on the criteria, and then we'll briefly look at the integrity and, and the protection. So when it comes to the criteria, there are a whole host of criteria defined by UNESCO, um, and many of them refer to cultural sites, and then there's a few um, that refer to natural sites, as the low country would be. Um, and, and not to go into the whole list, I've just singled out those that are of interest to us. That's uh, criteria nine and ten. So nine is basically looking at um, outstanding examples of, of ongoing ecological and biological processes. And that can be kind of broken down a bit further from our perspective is thinking about well, what is it we have? We've got the best and most extensive near continuous example of natural blanket bog found globally. And then a second element of that is it does display outstanding examples of, of ecological uh, process of, of peatlands. And I'll expand on these in the next slide a bit more. We also um, can nominate under uh, criteria 10, which is all around the, the, the kind of um, uh, biologically diverse uh, habitats and the, and, the, um, and the flora and fauna that, that they contain. And we, we're basically stating that the, the flow country has outstanding biodiversity representative blanket bog ecosystems. So that is interesting in itself in that blanket bogs are not known for their diversity, but, but the flow country, in fact, as, a, as an example, um, certainly uh, contains uh, the best diversity you might expect um, across a blanket bog region. So we can split them down a bit further. So, you know, the, that first element of it being a blanket bog, well, okay, so it's what's a blanket bog, this is what it is, and it's the best that we can see globally. So it forms over slopes and, and dips in the landscapes. We've also got great diversity throughout that area because of the, the, the gradients we see, the climatic and topographic and geographic gradients. And so that leads to a lot of bog macro form diversity. We can also take it into the, the fourth dimension and we can be thinking about the archive it provides and not in a, in, a, in a single site but across the whole area so we can understand how the whole area has developed through time and all of these really feed into it being a, a superb natural uh, laboratory for ongoing scientific and educational use and that that is borne out by the number of publications which um, have come out of the low country and continue to, to come from there thinking about the kind of ongoing ecological processes of the peatlands. I think this is a, an, an interesting element because uh, climate change is not anywhere specifically defined um, as, a, as an important element within world heritage. However, the, the ongoing ecological process in peatlands of sequestration and storage of carbon is of course hugely important. So that's another element that we're, we're looking at. Then when it comes to the outstanding biodiversity, we can think about the different species associations we see, and that's from a, uh, the bird life to the invertebrates um, uh, and obviously the plant life. And of course, that diversity is supported by those same uh, gradients in, in climate, topography, geography and geology. And we can also look at how the, the water quality is influenced by the, 
by the blanket bog system. So we have things like the freshwater pearl mussel, the European eel, and, and salmon populations all being strong within the area, and they're supported um, by that by that high quality water um, that's coming up away from the the blanket bog. So just to have a quick look at some of these elements, I'm not going to dwell on these. Um, I, I'm, I must say I'm not a peatlands expert, so um, please excuse any errors. But I thought it was worthwhile to just see some of that diversity. And this is a, a fantastic view of um, Knockfin Heights. And we can see all of these different types of, of, of mires, the spur mire coming down here. It's unfortunately a bit obscured by my picture, I think, on the map where these are to show their actual topographic form. We've got valley side mires. As we see either side of here and, and saddle mire. So we've got all of these different hydrological elements blanketing the region. We can also see uh, the Ben Grahams in the background there, just for giving some context for those that know the area. When we zoom in a bit further, so this is actually near Krask, we see all of that kind of intricate patchwork of different um, of, of different varieties of moss. We've got the Rachimitrium hummocks, we've got areas of sphagnum in the in the damper hollows, and we've got a whole bunch of, uh, of, of reindeer moss um, covering the areas in between, and then some classic flow country weather off to the west there. And then we get even closer and we see this fantastic patchwork of, of the different sphagnums, um, up to nearly 30 different species found within the flow country. And then some of these fantastic sundews that, that enjoy uh, trying to get some of the midges out of the, out of the circulation, which we can only support. And of course, then there's some larger animals around as well. It's a nice golden plover um, blending in nicely with some of the grasses and heathers growing in some of the, the drier heath areas. So that's the, the criteria. In terms of the integrity, we need to think about um, how this patchwork of areas can be protected to, to the greatest extent. And to do that, that's where we've got to make the decisions around drawing this boundary. And we can see the, the areas that have been done already. So these are the, the kind of uh, the purple areas um, where we've, we've kind of revised the boundary. And we've got a whole lot of other blue lines around where we're still just tinkering around the edges. But the key thing is, is to try and create a boundary that encloses the hydrological units and considers the other land uses. So we can see a lot of forestry here, some's excluded and some's included, depending on its likelihood to, well, be restored, or in fact, a lot of it is already under restoration. So there's a lot of kind of variety there we see in how we start thinking about that boundary. But the key thing is, is that we make it as large an area as possible but focus on the outstanding universal value. So we don't need to include the strats that go down between these areas, blanket bog, because they're effectively uh, farmland and all we would do is, is cause problems for, the, for the, um, the crofters if we did that. And in terms of those land use issues, I think this, this image just, I think, summarizes really nicely um, the kind of the, the potential conflicts and the kind of history of, of the land as well. Um, so this is just beside the, um, the River Strathy, and we see going down to the, the side there. We've got these beautiful areas of, of pool systems developed um, in what we might call near pristine uh, blanket bog, but we can see right next to that these dendritic uh, patterns of, of, of old plough marks, and these are dating back to well, when they were they were trying to improve the land for, for grazing. And in fact, when you get down in the ground, you barely see these now, but they're still relics in the landscape. And then we move across to much more recent elements of, of that land management where we've got modern uh, forestry going on. And then, in fact, wind farms. And this is, I mean, wind farms are uh, hugely divisive of opinion. Um, in this instance, we can see that that wind farm has been put in. Obviously, those tracks, so they've had to take out peat to put them in and the foundations for the wind farm. However, what we see beside that is that they've felled the forestry um, and they've, they've put at that in a, into a reclamation process. So we've got those those balances of land uses and, and the, the potential damage and the potential improvements that, that can be made. So it's a, that's when the, the kind of management really comes into this and trying to get that consensus approach. And if we just look at that um, kind of in a bit more detail and maybe it seems a little bit messy here, but I think it's kind of useful to think about how all of these things balance out and what we need to do in, within the World Heritage bid, as I mentioned, is to reach that consensus. So when we think about some of the elements that are going on, so we're thinking about uh, these wind farm developments that might be considered an, an kind of industrialization of the landscape. They may potentially degrade some of the outstanding universal value. However, we can think that they might be used also to support some of the universal value. 
And then we've got to think that we've got to balance those elements with what we need to bring with us the community. It's these people that live there and they're hugely important to the site. Um, and then the political support as well. And so we peel back the layers there a bit further. We start to see real contradictions because we start to see, well, actually from a climatic perspective, well, let's think about policy, I suppose. Um, policy is that we, we want to deal with the climate crisis. Now, now wind farms, of course, will help us um, move away from a, a carbon dependent um, society. Um, great, but they may cause damage to the to the to the the peatlands, and they are really important from the point of view of sequestration. And then there's all elements around kind of jobs and development, and then pr the protection that might that will be provided and the and the accolade. And, and how, how important that is to the communities. And then of course, there's the time. And we are time limited when, when we're coming to this, coming trying to get through this project. So just to give a really quick summary, hopefully I've given you a bit of an idea of the timeline running right back to the 80s, um, how we're proposing to bring this project forward. And then what the kind of structure of World Heritage is, particularly in terms of the outstanding universal value, the integrity, um, and the protection and the management. And then finally, we've just kind of touched on some of the key challenges there uh, that we're facing and how we need to try and work through those so as we can bring everyone along um, with us in this project. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to chatting through any questions or queries at the, at the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Stephen, for a very interesting talk and principally highlighting how our peatlands fit into the wider landscape and also how those balances we have to reconcile with different land uses, which is always difficult, but it's something we have to look at how we actually go into the future, because a lot of these land uses have a relevance for many people and just as relevant, uh, just as, relevant as peatlands have for us. I'd like to go to the next talk, uh, which is uh, from Trish Fox um, from Northern Ireland. Originally, Trish was a, a journalist um, and now is a, more recently a graduate of uh, Belfast, Queens and the University of Western Australia. She worked, she's worked for the last 20 years in ecological restoration uh, on endangered habitats. Now she's working with CAN Project and by her own admission is a bog trotter and now coordinates the restoration of four alkaline fens in that project. Something you should know about Trish is during lockdown, she has developed a passion for hoverflies and now hoping one of her records could have actually be a first, first in Ireland. So uh, over to you, Trish. We look forward to your, your interesting talk on uh, the fens. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Ian and Andrew for the introduction and thank you to the IUCN for the invitation to come and talk to you today at the conference about the lovely Lacale Fens in County Down. I work for Ulster Wildlife for one of the 47 wildlife trusts across the UK and we are a partner in the Collaborative Action for the Natura Network Project. Newry Moore and Down District Council are our lead partner and we have a couple of other charities, a couple of research institutions and we're just about starting the fifth year of a five-year project. Um, we're funded by Interreg and Interreg is specifically designed to help projects where borders um, add an extra issue. So as you can imagine, for the natural environment, the border is kind of an irrelevancy. So for the, the six um, counties in Northern Ireland and the six border counties in the Republic of Ireland, that border can sometimes run right through the middle of a designated site. Um, sometimes a land might be designated on one side of the border, but not on the other. So it, it does cause management challenges, and management issues particularly for not only for the habitats, but for the species such as marsh artillery or hen harrier that um, move across that border frequently. So um, that's what Interreg is specifically designed to do. Ulster Wildlife mostly in this project works on raised bogs, but we do have a big blanket bog site, um, Quilka and Niren. But I'll talk today specifically about the alkaline fens that we work on. So why do we want to work on them? Well, unfortunately, it's the same sad story for most of our priority habitats. They're in bad declining condition, both within the designated network and outside of that. And it's the usual suspects. Um, they're either overgrazed or undergrazed. Um, they're often 
little fragments that are left in a heavily um, used agricultural setting. Um, some of them have too much water taken out of them uh, or um, too much pollution going into them, too many nutrients going in. So lots of management challenges for these sites. So this is what um, one of the Lacale fens looks like. Now, there are four fens and they are spread over quite a large area of um, county, southeast County Down. Um, they wouldn't uh, be thought of sort of collectively by their owners as part of a, a network because they are so um, spread out. Uh, so we tend to work on them specifically with just the owners of one site rather than the SAC across the SACs. Corbally is the largest of the four fens. Ballycam is the smallest. It's only three hectares. And Corbally is the largest at 19 hectares. Uh, Corbally as a, a townland means odd townland. And that's got nothing to do with anybody who lives there. It's just that the shape of the townland itself was an unusual shape. And you can see it here, long, thin site, um, watercourse runs right up the middle of it. And typical inter-Drumlin, sort of post-glacial county down landscape uh, with a range of land uses around it. So there's some sheep grazing, there's um, beef cattle, there's dairy cattle, there's cropping, all, all sorts of different pressures on the site. And the map on the left shows the ownership pattern on the site. So there are eight colours there, but there's actually only seven owners of the site. So again, that can um, present some management challenges. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have too many with this particular site. We did have one owner who said he didn't want to be told what to do on his land, but we could certainly go on and do whatever we liked. So that was good. So, um, what does it look like? Well, this is a fairly typical scene. Um, probably showing some of the issues that the fen faces. So we've got some very large willows in there and we've got some areas that are quite rank with uh, meadow sweet and the reed growth is um, too high in some areas. The thatch cover is a bit too high and um, you'd be surprised to hear that the sun doesn't always shine in, shine in County Down. So there it is under darker skies, much more familiar and um, quite quite a beautiful site and really a uh, really little oasis of natural land amongst this farming landscape. So very important for lots of species. Um, I refuse to describe this bird as common snipe anymore, seeing as it's in such um, low numbers now. Reed beds, of course, very important for species like grasshopper warbler and reed bunting. And, um, um, the Lacale fens, although they're designated as alkaline fen under the um, special scientific interest designations, they're all significant for their higher plants. So we've got um, pond, um, pondweed, fen pondweed, Potamogeton in Corbally. Loch Keelan is actually officially an important stonewort area. We have four rare species over there. And we've also got this lovely soft hornwort and um, ceratophyllum submersum, which is found there and at only two other sites in Ireland. So really, really significant. Of course, also significant for their invertebrate assemblages, not surprisingly. And Corbally and Loch Keelan, again, out of the four of them, um, very important, very species rich, lots of fairly common species like the reed beetle, but also some real rarities like the Irish damselfly, which is the, the species that's endemic to Ireland. Beautiful little dragonfly, damselfly. So um, we kind of, well, we started in 2017 and we knew that Corbally was going to have some surprises because Bobby Hamill had been out doing condition assessments in 2016 and had found some marsh fertility webs. So for those of you who um, don't know about this particular butterfly, um, it's the only invertebrate protected under um, Annex 2 of the Species Directive. It relies completely on this devil's bit scabious as its food plant for the caterpillars. And the caterpillars tend to form these lovely communal webs, which you can find in sort of September, October time. And they hibernate um, over winter in them. So in trouble right across Europe really has dropped out of some countries almost completely and the UK and Ireland are thought to be strongholds for it. But even so, we've, we're still facing real decline. So very important that 
we manage the sites where um, it's found. I guess it wasn't a total surprise for Bobby to find it at Corbally because Corbally is very close to another large fen called Ballycobeg, which is actually designated for marsh fertility. So Corbally is a good sort of supplementary population now for that, that main population to the north. And then there's a smaller population at Ballykindler to the south. So the first thing we had to do was we had to have a real good understanding of where the fertility was um, throughout the fen so that um, none of the management recommendations we made for it were contradicting any management recommendations for the fen vegetation itself. So we put out a contract for special surveys. Alan Mellon Environmental won that contract. And here we've got um, Clive Mellon and Anna Hart serving in a particularly good bit of Devil's Bit Scabious. And we've we've got good um, understanding of what we need for this invertebrate. So um, relatively short vegetation, good density of devil's bit and not too much scrub. So we kind of you know knew what what to expect. And not surprisingly, they did find um, that that matched um, what they were finding on ground. So the habitat really determined where the good numbers of webs were. Um, Corbley has an interesting kind of grazing history. Um, as I said, that there's a stream that cuts the, the fen from north to south. That uh, eastern flank has really never been grazed. And uh, you can see that big open body of water down um, at the southern end. And the western flank has been grazed and is still being grazed. And the northern flank, once it was fenced off at designation, grazing stopped completely and it's become very rank. So um, some some interesting management issues there. Um, not surprisingly, as I say, very little devil's bit scabious down the southern end, so no marsh for it. So um, again, we have to think about um, who, man who owns what and who manages where. So we're looking at um, trying to alter gra some grazing regimes and reintroduce grazing in other areas. Um, and our, our CAN partner, AFBI, produced a scrub map for which showed where the scrub was invading specifically over the alkaline fen. So the alkaline fen is there in the in that turquoise kind of boundary. And you can see that in the sort of northwest of the site, you've got some invading ash that is, is actually still quite young and is actually quite badly dieback affected already. But then um, in the sort of central northwestern area, you've got those large stands of willow that I showed you before. And this kind of presented us with our first management conundrum, because when Dave Allen was out there, he spotted um, exit holes of the lunar hornet moth. And um, so knowing that clear wing moth is on site means that we wouldn't take out those mature willows now. We're going to leave them in situ and we'll take out any of the smaller germinants and um, take out the small ash and leave those big trees um, for the insects and for the birds. So, uh, you know, we had marsh frit, we have lunar hornet moth. We, we kind of thought that was the end of the story, but it wasn't. It was really the start of it, because when Roy Anderson was out doing the marsh frit surveys with Dave Allen, um, he found something else and Dave rang me one morning and said, um, I think you're going to need to sit down because Roy has found De Moulin's swirl snail. And um, this vertigo species had never been found before in Northern Ireland. The nearest population is on the Shannon Callows, which is a couple of hundred miles um, south. And um, it had never been found, not because it hadn't been looked for, because lots of people had looked for it very hard and never been found. Vertigo antivertigo is on this site, but Melinciana certainly had never been found here or anywhere else. So there was major excitement about it. Now, major excitement um, in the conservation world does not necessarily translate to major excitement in the farming world. But nevertheless, the owners came out with us one day. Here they are with um, Dave and Roy in the center there. And they all had to get their glasses on to have a look at this lovely tiny snail. Each um, adult's probably about the size of a grain of sand or a grain of rice, and each juvenile's probably about the size of poppy seeds, so really, really tiny. And um, 
see here in this picture, sort of in relation to somebody's hand, how minute they actually are. So there was great amusement amongst the farmers about um, the great fuss there was in the conservation world about the discovery of this species. But really does show how special Corbally is um, because this species has probably hung on since the Ice Age. And of course, having um, Dave and Clive and Roy and all those expert eyes on site, including Mark Telfer, who came across to do um, more vertigo um, surveys, meant that we then found more species. So I think we now have another three rove beetles that are new to science um, or new, sorry, new to Ireland, not new to science, but new to Ireland and um, a fungus that is only found on the wing of a certain beetle and that is also new to Ireland. So I think after that, I, I said, OK, Mark Telfer was not allowed on the site anymore because enough was enough. Just we had enough to deal with. Never mind anything else. So we we put out another survey partic or a job particularly to look at the Vertigo um, Linciana because um, we needed to know, understand where it was in relation to the grazing regime and um, the, the management units or the ownership units. And this is um, Dave and Clive's heat map of the site. So you can see it's sort of clustered in the north and the south with a little bit through that central area. Mostly in, in typical habitat, those southern um, parts are not really um, typical. They would be suboptimal, but um, present in, in decent numbers. So they did surveys from September to December every month and um, did followed Natural England protocol for sampling. And I think um, the most they found in any 20 minute survey was about a thousand adults and about 700 juveniles. So you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands there are at the site. So really, really very, very significant. So again, how do we manage this? Because we want to get grazing back into that northern end where it's very rank but we don't necessarily want to introduce grazing um, to an area where there are snails and where there hasn't been grazing for a long time, because our understanding is that this can knock the population out. So the um, compromise that we came up with was to put a temporary electric fence that's solar powered in, in this area that's just delineated in red up the north. And you'll see there, that's the fence. So um, it just fences off a couple of hectares. And the idea was that we'd get conic ponies in. Northern Ireland Environment Agency had conic ponies at a wetland very close by. And we were going to put them in for a couple of weeks and there we would get that rank vegetation knocked down. However, there's always a however. <laughs> Our insurers didn't particularly like this idea because we don't own the stock and we don't own the land and they refused to underwrite the activity. So we had to think again. So what we're doing instead um, is bringing in this bit of kit, which is a Robocut, which is a remote controlled um, flail that is mostly used on bogs for knocking down heather and um, purple moor grass. And that is going to be trialled on the site instead. We'll also take down an Allen scythe and try and cut the vegetation down, take it off site to remove the nutrient levels and then hopefully we're hoping one of the owners will, will put some stock back in very occasionally. So really, um, my conclusion is that these fens are very complex. They're often um, under multiple owners. They have um, you know, multiple different habitat types on them, lots of different species. As soon as you look, you find more there than you bargained for. But I think they are worth the hard work because they are so significant and um, they are conserved already through the designation process. But it's really important that they are managed going forward, that it's not just a case of put the fence up and walk away. And that when you've got certain species like the Desmoulins Swirl snail and the marsh frit and even the lunar hornet moth, that you can do a little bit of micromanagement to enable these um, species to persist at these sites going forward. So thank you all um, for listening and I would welcome any questions and I'd certainly love a chat with anybody who manages um, sites with the Desmoulins Wall snail on it because I'd love some tips. So thanks for listening. Bye bye.
Thank you, Trish, for a very interesting talk on the, the complexities of how to manage um, some of our lowland um, peatland sites. I think, again, we're coming quite across a, a similar vein of thought about the effects of boundaries and lines on maps and the effect where we put fences or where fences have been put in quite the distant past and how we manage manage sites into the future. I think it's also interesting that the sort of quandaries that we face when we're managing better habitats is that inevitably you're going to have a much wider range of species there those species are actually going to want, have specific requirements and i remember when i was managing a fence site many years ago our uh, diptera expert came running out when we were cutting grass and no no you can't cut that bit of grass because it's this rare diptera there and you you sort of ended up thinking well what can we actually do here if it, the grass was left to go rank the diptera would die out and it's it's about understanding a lot more about these different species and i think that's something that we've got to go go much more into I'm, i must admit now, next time i chop a willow down i'm going to be looking out more for lunar moths so thank you very much trish we move on to um patrick green um patrick works for natural resources wales as a project manager for the life wales Welsh Raised Bogs project. He manages a small team to restore and educate and engage people with their bogs. The project aims to restore seven of the most important lowland raised, bog, lowland raised bogs in Wales. And despite having a long career in conservation and land management, he's relatively new to peatlands and loving every minute of it. Outside of his work, Patrick is a very outdoorsy type, attempting not to break bones, either climbing or mountain biking. So thank you very much, Patrick. I'll hand over to you. Uh, my name is Patrick Green. I'm the project manager for the Life Welsh Rears Bogs project here in Wales. Uh, I'm just going to do a short presentation today about the project and what we've been up to over the last three or four years. So our project involves the restoration of seven SAC Lowland Rears Bogs. Um, it's a five year project which runs through to March 2023 and the total project cost of around four and a half million pounds. Um, and we have, as I say, we have seven sites across the country and the, by far the two bigger sites are in Caradigian, which is sort of Midwest Wales, and they are of course Fochnall uh, and of course Carron. So I'm gonna concentrate on those today um, because of the time scales that we have to, to give the presentation. Okay, so what are we trying to do within the project? Well. Altogether, the project is about 970 hectares of lawn and raised bog, and we are effectively what we're trying to do is to restore it from unfavourable to favourable condition. Um, this is a, a bit of a basic slide for an IUCN peatland conference, but I'm going to put it up anyway. Um, so, site on the left, obviously, it's uh, millennia dominated, uh, bits of sc scrub around, birch and willow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very little sphagnum, uh, low water table, and the site on the right is the sort of site where you know we want to get to the sort of state we want to get to so a much higher water table um we're looking at sort of between sort of 10 and 5 centimeters um uh, sort of water table in relation to the surface um hopefully developing sphagnum rich um, substrate and uh, sort of humic and hollow topography typical of low and raised bogs so our sites um, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on the two main sites because that's where about 75% of the project budget is going, which is cause Fochnell, which is the two sites on the left hand side of the screen there, and cause Karen on your right. So cause Fochnell extends to about 500 hectares and really is a magnificent site right on the W estuary if you've never visited. Uh, and cause Karen, which is on the edge of Tregaron, it's about 350 hectares and consists of sort of three bog domes. So we're doing work on um, all three bog domes of course Karen, as well as course Faulkner. So I guess one of the first stages that we, we do when we're, you know, after the initial planning stage is to try and deal with vegetation. So uh, this is our piston bully machine and, and we've presented about this machine at previous IUCN conferences, including a presentation by my colleague Jack Simpson in, in, um, in Belfast a, few, a couple of years ago. Uh, this machine is really good at, at having a first hit on millennia and really trying to suppress it. And then, you know, following on from that, we get into scrub control. Uh, and I'd just like to take you through the sort of sequence of events on a 
the site that we're looking to restore uh, this year particularly, but also did something on it last year, which is the West Bog at Course Karen. So we'll, here you see in this slide, um, the the sort of dots there indicate big clumps of scrub. Uh, as you can see over the whole 200 hectare raised bog dome, we had lots and lots of scattered scrub, uh, bachelor and salic species. Um, and um, so, you know, our very first initiation is to sort of go in there and try and deal with some of that to stop the sort of evapotranspiration that you get from leaving scrub on these bog sites. Uh, the yellow blobs you can see are out of vulnerable zones. So, you know, this is this is a map from one of our, our work packages that the contractor did last last winter for us. So following on from, from last winter's work, um, we then look at our, our dip well data. Um, we have a number of dip wells on the West Bog here. Um, and, you know, that gives us some really good information, which I'll, which I'll share with you now. Um, so having looked at that information, as you see, C2, C3, C4 and C5 relate to the dip wells right across the centre of the dome there. Um, and, you know, you can you can see straight away that what we're getting is quite a large summer drawdown. Um, I mean, even at C3 there, which is the dip well right in the centre of the West Bog Dome, um, you're seeing, you know, drawdown some in the summer to sort of 35 centimetres below the um, the ground level and um, the red lines indicate the sort of the Richard Lindsay parameters um, of a healthy raised bog so you know we're looking to keep water levels within 10 centimetres of the surface for 95 percent of the year so we you know we, if we we've identified there is an issue um, and then you know we then look to do something about that issue so one of our main techniques we've been using is this low elevation contour bonding uh, and I have a video for you in a second, um, but here's some of the maps for this winter's work. Uh, we have contracts starting at the end of this month. And um, as you can see, there's reprofiling work uh, as well as new bonds going in um, on, on this site. Something like 33 kilometers of bonding are going in on um, well, this site and the, the, um, the northeast and southeast bogs in, of, of course, Karen. So a lot of work this winter. As you can see from the right map, we we decided following discussions with um, our, our peatland policy and um, advisory colleagues, Pete Jones and others, that we would put a, a central bond around the sort of middle area of the bog based on our dip well data. Um, we know from both the dip well data and the vegetation composition that um, this this site is dry and you know we need to do something to retain the surface water on that bog dome. So this is our other main site, Cos Fockner. We were particularly pleased with the way the contractors uh, um, carried out the, the bunding work last winter. The map on the left shows you some of the bunding work um, that we did last winter 2021. Uh, and um, we've got a quite interesting situation of Cos Fockner, these little sort of what we're calling mini bogs. They're bisected by large water bodies. Um, so we've actually had to class them as sort of individual little bogs uh, and bund around them. And when we're bunding as well, we're also we're also ditch blocking with peat, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the, the main activity is, is this low elevation contour bunding that you can see in your picture to the right. Um, the borrow pits are quite shallow. You know, we try to keep them under 30 centimetres. Um, and even now, you know, not not even a year later, some of those um, those borrow pits are starting to fill up with sphagnum. Uh, every 20 metres or so we have a cross bond and that's to stop fetch on the water um, and to enable sphagnum to, to colonise um, and they seem to be working really well. They also stop sort of you know potential breakage and um, means that if one bond goes that the uh, the water doesn't drain from the whole the whole site. The central picture there is the work that we're going to do in 21-22, so this winter, and we have contractors on site as we speak, uh, getting on with that work, so so that's good. It's nice and dry at the moment for them. So I'm just going to play a video now of the bunding work, give you an idea how it's how it's done. OK, 
okay so here we have a, a video of some of the bonding work that took place last winter and uh, as you can see the contractor is taking off the surface vegetation uh, putting that on one side initially taking off some of the degraded peat and then digging down into the ombrotrophic peat and packing that in the trench to create a sort of a watertight seal and then he lays the vegetation back over the bund that's been created and tamps that down um, and that stops scrubbing grass uh, and stops the bun from drying out and cracking. But it's a yeah, very, very skilled work, as you can see, and there's some of the results. Um, you know, fantastic uh, ground pressure, low ground pressure machines that hardly create any damage whatsoever. We've had local landowners out and they can't believe we've had machines on here um, and the results are excellent. And as I said, some of those burrow pits are already starting to fill in with sphagnum uh, less than a year later. So it's an excellent, excellent technique, and um, you know we've been delighted with the the work of the contractors, and hopefully we can show you all some of this next next year. Just point out the machines don't work this fast normally. Um, it'd be quite good if they did, but you can't really see from the video here, but the machine's sitting on bog mats, um, and as he's moving along, he's swinging that bog mat in front of him. And this is necessary really for, you know, just the, the safety, um, but also for the, the fact that there's less ground damage as well. So back to the main presentation. So if we look at the course current restoration on the northeast bog, you can see on the left of the screen here, the some of the work we did on the northeast bog. Um, last winter, so 2021, um, and, and some of the work here in the middle. There's a photograph of the work here. The bun technique was slightly different. We had to use um, slightly higher buns because of the, the contours there, um, steeper contours from towards the edge of the bog where we've had some slumpage and things. Um, but again, similar idea to the video I've just shown you. And um, and, and the picture on the right is the work we hope to to do this winter. So there's a drawn picture of the work from 2021 um, and you can see really clearly the work is described as a contour bonding effect um, and also the cross bonds and so on. Um, you know, it'd be great to fly this in a year's time to see if, if those over there as a water have disappeared and we've just got lovely sphagnum um, in those pools and um, tracking back onto the middle of the bog. So again, if you if you look there, we've got a dip well network on um, on the northeast bog, which gives us some really good information. And if you could take, take a view of CC10 dip well and uh, CC22, but particularly CC10. And then if you look at this graph, um, you know, it's very, very early days, but um, if, if you look at sort of last year, um, in May last year, and that CC10, which you can see is up there um, on that, just below that top bond, it you had a drawdown there of getting on for 20 centimetres at one point, whereas um, yeah, slightly different weather conditions in 2021, um, but um, not noticeably different. And, you know, we've got CC10 there showing levels above five centimetres. So, you know, really good change there. Again, too early to draw strong conclusions, but, you know, hopefully that's a sign of the enhanced resilience that we're, we're looking for. Um, Obviously, we try to get appropriate grazing on these sites as well, um, wherever possible, you know, working with tenants and things. And um, we've had you know, very good success with uh, with Highland cattle. Um, but um, as always, it's quite a struggle to get 
the, the right grazing um, on, on sites. And I think that's probably the case for, for bog sites across the country. And I um, haven't got time to go into our sort of monitoring, main monitoring effort, but we're working closely with CH, UEL, BGS to monitor vegetation, hydrology, greenhouse gas and some other parameters. So um, we'll hopefully have good results to you know, be able to share towards the end of our project. Um, so by middle of next year, we should have some some really good results we can we can share with you all. Um, and um, just want to thank everybody and um, for listening and welcome them to Wales for ICM Peatland Conference in 2022. Um, by that time, we should have done around 60 kilometres of low elevation contour bunding um, out of a total of 72 kilometres um, and other hydrological works on uh, peripheral drainage ditches and things. So we'll have plenty to show you in 2022. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I think that's really whetted our appetites to uh, a trip to Wales next year. That's certainly uh, where we're all going to be heading. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And I don't know whether you know this or people have said already, but you can actually vote for the different questions. You should see all the questions actually coming up. Uh, I'd advise you to vote because we've got so many questions here. We're not going to be able to get through them. So I am a a believer in some sort of democracy so there's an opportunity for that to so get your question higher up the list but I'm, I'm going to kick off with a question that I saw which will be a quick answer and it's it's straight to Trish and that is it says just wondering why you plan to use conic ponies over a native breed so that should be a relatively quick one. Um, yeah that's a great question and um, we didn't have any um, native horses that we could use in the vicinity, the conic ponies, it was really just a practicality because they were so local. Um, we did then ultimately find some Kerry bog ponies who might have been a, a possibility again, but now we are um, looking at maybe Irish moiled cattle, which is a, a native breed of cattle. So it was really just because the conics were so close and they were being used for wetland management, but I fully appreciate that there are native breeds that are um, just as suitable. Okay, thanks very much, Trish. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question. It's, it's top of the list at the moment, or joint top of the list at the moment. And is that, can we, can we have a clear and agreed upon definitions of what active, intact, and stick to those in appropriate documents? Because we need to be careful with different messages. I think that's a, that's a very good question because there's lots of different definitions that go on. Has anybody got on the panel got any comments on that? Okay, I'll go for that one then. Okay, well <laughs> done, Trish. I would just say that, that active is, is generally accepted to be peat forming. So it's not just a dead bog sitting there. You know, a, a bog can be inactive, um, but it's not getting um, proper contact. The sphagnum isn't in proper contact with the um, water table for long enough to allow it to grow and reproduce. Um, intact, I guess, I would see that as probably uncut and undrained. So I, th I can't remember what the third one was. What was the third one? The third one was well, I just said stick stick to the messages in the doc documents. But I yes. think I think I think you've covered it well there, Trish. I think it is it's intact, hydrologically intact when people are saying that. But I think a lot of mm -hmm. wetland terms are used in sort of uh, off the cuff methods. Uh, Patrick, we do you have something? Yeah, sorry, I, I, just, I was just going to add to, to Trish had to say really that, I mean, in our sort of um, project documents, we use active and degraded. I don't know whether that's any more helpful or even more confusing, but um, but active being peat forming and and, and um, degraded, I guess, me, you know, it's not fully defined, but you know, meaning non peat forming or um, needs a response, I suppose. Um, but yeah, this. I think you're right. I think there's some nomenclature I think that needs sorting out in relation to this, isn't it? Degraded, intact, and active. Yeah. I think yeah. we we say for degraded that it's um, likely to return to active within 30 years if active if management is introduced. Mm. <laughs> That's the that's right, because I think that's the that's the Natura um, definition as well. Yeah. 
Oh, right. Okay. Well, we'll move quickly on. This this question seems to be very popular as well. It's what are, what's been the most positive and useful communications that any of you have had with land managers, land managers or owners or the public to demonstrate the importance of healthy peatlands and the need to protect uh, protect them. So, Trish, go, I'll come back to you straight away. What did you do to um, encourage the landowners about the desmoulin sn sn uh, snails? <laughs> Well, initially what we did was we, we invited all of the fen owners together, but the four fens were very geographically set apart. So the owners didn't really identify that they were part of that group. So then we, we drilled down and just met, brought together the owners of each specific fen. So we basically brought them to the local hotel and gave a little presentation and then gathered their kind of feedback about the area. And so they were able to tell us some really interesting facts, such as the fact that the water course, the direction of the water course through the fen had once been reversed for a, a local mill and that kind of thing. And we just kind of kept that going. So we, we brought them out on site. A lot of them had never been on it. You know, it's, it's wet, it's, they're, they're busy people, or maybe they don't even live beside it anymore. So that was great to actually bring them out onto it. And then we just send them really regular email updates, with little newsletters and, you know, telling them what's going on. We always tell them if a, an expert wants to go out on site, we never assume that we can just, you know, pop out. And um, this, this particular group has just been fantastic to work with. They are really keen. We have to get their permission for everything we do. And we've never had anybody say no. So it's been very positive all around. So that working with a small group, I think, is is the key thing. Thanks, Trish. And any of the other panelists, any sort of tips for engaging with land managers? I think I would just, um, you know, agree with Trish that getting people out has is, is, is been the, the best thing, you know, you could possibly do. Um, you know, we produce a newsletter and, um, you know, we're, we're quite big on social media and produce a lot of videos and, um, have a lot of photographs on social media. I think that, that generates um, fantastic um, interest. But I think in terms of landowners specifically, they like to see things on site, um, particularly if it involves big machines. Um, and, um, you know, definitely getting people out on site and just talking to them and being open and honest and answering questions, answering their questions. Um, it's been the best thing I think, for us. Okay, thanks. Any, any other thing else? Anybody want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that these guys have, have covered it pretty well. It's just about regular um, conversation, isn't it? And I think one of the things, um, it's not shying away from the, the difficult issues. Um, yeah. You know, just, you know, got to grasp them and, and, and discuss them openly and, and, you know, make sure everyone's free to put across their on, honest opinions because that's the only way you'll get to the bottom of it. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Good point. Final question, I think. Well, it depends how quickly we can answer this. It's what has been done to what can be done to better coordinate and resource biodiversity monitoring. Now that I, we could probably talk all night about that, but I don't. I, I, I'm not sure myself what could be done. But there's no doubt that we actually do need to coordinate more of this. We we haven't got a lot of the information, for example, on even some protected species. We don't really understand what their requirements are. Just wondered if anybody on the panel's got any thoughts on. How we can, how we can improve that biodiversity monitoring? <laughs> I said it was a big question. <laughs> I would just 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 to chip in. I mean, um, from the from the outset, is I mean, the flow country is huge <laughs> and very very difficult to get to. Just the sheer cost of looking at biodiversity is, you know, um, in a in a meaningful way, I think is very tricky. I think there's some really amazing techniques coming about to actually monitor the blanket bog um, using remote sensing. But of course, that's not something that 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 we can really use for biodiversity, other than saying, well, if the blanket bog is in good condition, then we might assume that it will support the best biodiversity it can. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Anybody else going to dare touch that one? If not, I've got, I've got, we'll get another one in, which is actually very interesting as well. Is there a financial resource requirement for the areas that are most readily recoverable? And are they being outcompeted by carbon focused projects of more degraded people? And I think that's a really interesting question. Anybody want to take that? St Stephen, that's right into your area. <laughs> Doesn't mean I want to answer it. <laughs> okay, you don't have to. I'll give you time to time to think, Trish. <laughs> Trish. 
Um, Trish or Patrick? Well, I think the danger is that now carbon is going to be the new goal that we all have to chase. And, you know, if our sites, particularly the very small fence sites, if they're not going to capture enough carbon, they're not going to get the funding. And that's that's quite wrong. We just come through this interreg um, scheme, which is focused very much on outputs. And now we understand that the new round is, is you know, going to include biodiversity, but may not include water quality. So our water companies may not be able to do peatland restoration because their aim is to improve the water quality, but they may not be able to access the funding because, you know, it's, it's only about carbon and nobody's going to consider water quality. So it's a bit exhausting kind of when the goalposts are shifting all the time. We need some sort of holistic view of the whole country and for everybody to stop working in their little silos of rivers agencies and ammonia people and you know we need some sort of overall network that's the kind of big picture dream all, all i'd say is that um you know it's, i guess it's a fundamental tenet of, of you know good conservation management that you protect the, the best and um some of our sites you know from the outset or the outside looking in um you know they look amazing but we we know from you know our, our detailed monitoring that some of them are not as amazing as they could be like shown by that, those hydrographs so i think you know we need to protect those sort of jewel in the crown sites as as um you know as kind of key examples of what peatland can be like if we if we spend the money and and dedicate some time and effort to them um and you know it, is, it inspires people as well i think if we can get these these really big jewel in the crown sites back in a, in a great condition mm -hmm. so um yeah let's let's tackle the degraded sites but not to the exclusion of of these um the, the, the sort of jewel in the crown sites sounds good sounds good um stephen do you want to have the last word on that you've had a time um, to think <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think from my perspective, the, the key for us is to, to kind of make, make the most effective um, use of, of restoration. So identifying what what's going to provide the biggest gains. Um, uh, and I think under I think there seems to me to be a, a need for more research into kind of what what what's kind of natural as well within some of these settings, because within the Thaw country, there's areas where you look at and you go well yes that that's degraded and there's, there's hags and so on developed but i think we're, we still need to understand how how much that is a process of of land management and how much some of these features may be natural and reflect underlying um drainage networks and so on so i think it, it's about yeah un, uh, understanding what what's going to give us the, the biggest benefit i suppose that's a good answer. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you all, to all the presenters, Ian, Stephen, Trish and Patrick, for some excellent uh, presentations there. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention as well this afternoon and some great questions, which unfortunately we didn't, haven't got to answer yet. Perhaps there'll be a uh, space further on in, in the conference to actually answer those. So that's the end of this session. And we look forward to seeing everyone at 9.30 tomorrow to explore the role of landscape and partnerships in the peatland restoration and recovery. So we'll see you then. Thank you all very much for your attention. Cheerio. Great. Thank you.